about Sunday. Uh, I really appreciated the meal, all of your cards, those of you that gave us gifts, and then the church gave us a gift. I appreciate it from the depths of my heart. Man, you're just, you're outpouring of love and support to me and my family, and I thank you from the depths of our heart. And I know one thing, I'm going to eat good. <laughs> I'm going to eat really good. And might even go on a little vacation coming up and have a little money to do that. So thank you. We appreciate it from the depths of our heart. And the food, well, Dad just always looked for a good excuse to eat. If you went out of here hungry Sunday, honey, that's your fault. I've never seen so much food. <laughs> but it was good. We had a good time in the Lord. And I just wanted to tell you, thank you. I appreciate Victory Baptist Church and what you do for me and for my family. Also, do remember the time change? I just mentioned that. Fall back an hour. Uh, I had a preacher one time said, fall forward. <laughs> and I sat there and scratched my head. I couldn't figure out. But no, fall back. Drop back an hour on your clock. Uh, Sunday morning, prayer time at 9.30. Then our Bible study class is at 9.45. And then our worship service at 11 o'clock. So you remember that coming up the Lord's Day. Christmas play is right around the corner. I think they're shooting for the 1st of December for that. So be in prayer about that. Uh, don't forget the Tuesday morning Bible study. Each and every Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock. Come be a part of that if you can. All right. The backpacks. That's been <coughs> taken care of. So the deadline's up on that. If you're trying to pack a backpack now, you'll just have to take it straight to the associational office you yourself. You've got till Saturday to do that if you want to take one over there. But uh, I think we ended up with right many from the church. How many did WMU do? 24. WMU did 24. I think Charlie did about 50. 40. And then I think we had about 10 more back there. We took Sunday, so what's that? 74 backpacks. That's they are. Yeah. Well, I did the math. If you take the 61 churches that are in the association, if the 61 churches did what we did, you would have about 3,400 backpacks. So they're shooting for 1,000. That should be a very achievable goal. And it will make a difference in the hearts and lives of some of these young boys and young girls that basically have nothing there. It's an out Appalachian backpack ministry. So God bless you for what you've done there to try to help out with that. All right, any more announcements? <coughs> Sunday morning, yes, that's correct. Sunday morning, 8 o'clock, they're going to have a men's meeting here at the church. If you'd like to come, be a part of it, see what's going on with it. 8 o'clock, Sunday morning, down in the Christian Life Center, okay? There may be some food involved. I do not know. You may want to eat before you come. I do not know. But uh, Tim said he wanted to talk to me a little bit after service tonight about it. So, But 8 o'clock Sunday morning, come if you can. Be a part of that. Any more announcements? Thank you for reminding me of that. If not, our prayer time, those that we've been praying for, need to continue to pray for. The lost, there's many still around us. I was at the uh, Surrey Baptist Associational meeting Monday. It was the yearly meeting, and I went to the afternoon session at 4 o'clock. And there was a gentleman there from the Baptist State Convention that gave some pretty startling statistics on our county. Uh, Surrey County is a target that the State Baptist Convention has really got their eye on. And the reason they've really got their eye on it is because of the lostness in this county. Their research has determined that 85% of Surrey County is lost without Jesus. There's work to be done, folks. There's church buildings all around and pews are empty. And we, I'm afraid, many times are complacent in what we're doing and how we're going about. I wonder if the Lord's really pleased with how we're trying to get people into the house of God. I think I shared this Sunday. I saw it on the computer. It said instead of trying to invite people to church and wondering why they don't come, get them to Jesus, they get saved, then you can't beat them out of church. So, anyway, we may have to change our avenue of how we're trying to do church with people. Uh, 
You know, the Bible says go out into the highways, into the hedges, and compel them to come in. We've got the greatest story to tell. We're telling of the greatest thing that mankind has ever experienced, the love of God coming down to earth through his son Jesus Christ that has made a way for fallen man to be saved and go spend eternity with him in heaven. The only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ, God's son. May we as Christians have joy and excitement in our voices and in our, you know, uh, we as Christians, we need to be smiling more. We should be the happiest people on the face of the earth because of what Jesus has done for us. But do pray for the lost all around us. Uh, Diane Slate, she's at home recovering from her surgery, doing good. Marie Key, she is at home. She's recovering. She's been, she and I have been texting back and forth since Monday. She seems to be doing well. Thank you for your prayers on her behalf. Keep praying for Marie. I think her brother's scheduled for surgery next week, next week on his gallbladder. So Maybe do remember this week. Remember him. Uh, my father, I have to take him down early in the morning. I think about 7.45. We've got to be down at Winston. They're going to run that light down his throat to see what's going on with him. So I'd ask that you do remember him. Continue to lift him up as you pray. Warren Wilson's son continued to remember him. Mary, is there an update on him? Because he was uh, in surgery this morning at eleven forty-five. They went in to check and see how the wounds were, and they said that they looked uh, pretty good. And uh, his blood pressure and his blood sugar has uh, gone down some. Good, good. So everything is looking pretty good, I think. Well, that's good. That's good news. Keep praying for him as you will. J.D. and Marla, I'd ask that you continue to still remember both of them as you pray. Marsha, still remember her there at home as she's recovering. Any others you want to mention? Remember me as I see them again. Oh, no, Eddie. My goodness. Remember Eddie. Anybody else? This one. Joy and me crying as well in the hospital down there. We know Joy and we pray all of that too. Church and all churches need to remember as well. Yeah. And then it's certainly coming upon the time of the year flu, pneumonia, there'll be more and more. The hospital rooms will be full. Few cases on now, yeah. but I'll talk to that patient case this morning and of course probably a dozen cases of pneumonia. Remember all of these. Any others? Anybody, anyone? Jeff, would you pray for us, please, brother? Remember Ruth as well, please. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate the good humble prayer. If you will turn with me, I'll try not to keep you too long tonight. The book of Daniel, chapter number 10, still. And I do appreciate those of you that have made your way out to the Lord's house tonight. Because I'm sure with it being so gloomy and so messy, the devil probably put an excuse in every one of his mind of why he shouldn't or didn't have to come tonight. And some of you are going like this. Hey, you might as well be honest about it. Amen. Amen. I heard what a preacher told, I, I, a preacher said this not too long ago, and I put it in my little book of notes, because see, there's nothing original with me. I've probably heard it somewhere else. There's nothing original with me pertaining to the Word of God. All I do is give you what's already written right here in the Word of God. But this particular preacher made the comment, and I liked it. And for me to remember it, it must be pretty good, because I don't remember things. He said he had heard that it took somewhere around 9,000 gallons of water to fill a baptistry to baptize somebody. 
And it only takes about nine drops of rain to keep them out of God's house. <laughs> so I'll let you figure that math yourself. Daniel chapter number 10. I think I've got a mark down about verse 15. And I'll teach these next few verses in a totally different way probably than you've ever heard it taught. It's something that the Lord did show me. So I guess you could say it's an original here. But the Bible says... And when he had spoken such words unto me, I set my face toward the ground, and I became dumb. Now, when it says I became dumb, it doesn't mean mentally. You know, I claim to be dumb sometimes. But it's not talking about that. The dumb here means helpless, lifeless, beaten down. You know what I'm saying? Uh, who's speaking right here? It says... And when he had spoken such words. Well, if you go back up there, probably, probably Gabriel. Probably, probably. Because Michael is fighting the prince of Persia, right? Gabriel has left to come bring the message to Daniel. And we will find out that Gabriel is going back to help in the fight against the prince of Persia with Michael. But we know it's an angel, okay, that has spoken right here. I thought about this where it says, I set my face toward the ground and I became dumb. Has there ever, and you answer from your own heart, don't raise your hands, you know how I am. But has there ever been a time in your life when it seemed like you were just so low? You were just so down and out. Maybe just so discouraged. It could be for numerous reasons. It could be health. It could be church. Hey, let me go ahead and tell you tonight, if you're doing anything for the Lord, if you're working in the church and you're trying to do something for the Lord, the devil's got a great big bullseye on your back. He's your adversary. He's going to fight you. He's going to try to discourage you. He's going to try to defeat you because if he thinks he can defeat you, he can defeat some others in the flock. That's the way the devil works. But has there ever been a time in your life when you were just so physically helpless? Hey, it happens to the best of Christians sometimes. I think of Daniel right here. Blessed, a man of God that he's been referred to many times. I mean, we're talking about a man who was not scared of the den of lions, was he? He was not scared of that decree, and he publicly kept praying unto the God of Israel, knowing what his fate may be. But we're talking about the same man here a few chapters later who's helpless. He feels drained. He's a man of prayer. Do you not think that this is probably a time in his life when he has thought, I have prayed and prayed and prayed unto God and he has answered so many times and now it seems like I can't seemingly find him. I'll never forget what an old preacher told me right after I first announced my call to preach. He came over to the furniture store where I was at and he talked to me one day. And it's been about an hour there talking to me. And I really appreciate it. I've never forgotten that. I really didn't know this man that good at the time. But I got to know him better as it went. Of course, I had a lot of preachers trying to give me advice when I first started preaching. And I don't mean that bad. I thank God for them. But you've got to watch. Uh, not everybody's giving you advice. is giving you the right advice. But this man was giving me right advice. And he made a comment. He said, Joey, I'm going to tell you something. He said, Right now, you are just full and you are ready and you are ready to go and you're ready to preach and God's hands on you and there's a little bit of a protection on you, if you will, because he knows, God knows that the devil don't want you preaching and the devil's going to try to stop you and try to stop you quick. But God is going to be so bitch to you right now that the devil can't do nothing about it. But he said, you would mark her in your book. There'll come a time as the years come and as time goes, there will be times in your ministry when there will be times that God just feels so close to you. He's just right there all around you and loving you to death. And then there's going to be times in your ministry it's going to seem barren. It's going to seem dry. And it's going to seem like you're standing alone and you're wondering, where is God? He said, I'm here to give you some advice and some encouragement. In those times, don't lose faith. Don't lose sight of what you're doing because God's not gone. God is still there 
Amen. God is just trying to see Amen. how you're going to react and what kind of servant you're going to be for him. I wonder if Daniel maybe felt that way at this time. I don't know. I just wonder. I do know this. When it says, he, I set my face toward the ground and became dumb. I'm glad I'm still able to do this. And I'm thankful that I can. Because there's some that can't. But you know, I thought about this. Just setting his face towards the ground and became dumb. That is a true sign of humility. Amen. You know what that means? God, I'm helpless. God, I can't do anything. No matter what people may think of me, I really know what I am. I'm nothing but just an old sinner that's been saved by your marvelous grace. And I'm nothing. And I can do nothing without you. And I can take my next breath without you. I can't do it. I wonder if we got into our prayer meetings in churches anymore. If we really got in that position as a whole church. And began telling God, God, I really ain't what people think I may be sometimes. That I really do need you every hour of every day. That old song we sing, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour, I need you. It, to it shows total dependence upon an almighty God. I'm glad here at Victory Baptist Church, I know on Sunday mornings when we meet here at 930, we've got folks that'll come and get down, hands and knees, with their face before God here, here at this old-fashioned altar. There's times of invitation. And I don't know what people come up here to pray about. It's none of my business. If somebody wants me to pray with them, I'm sure they know to come get me. And I'll be glad to pray with them. But I'm glad there's one making intercession for you. Amen. Maybe you're just here to thank you. Maybe there's a burden. Maybe there's a trouble. Whatever it is, I'm glad people are still willing to realize that they're totally dependent upon God for everything in their life. I'm glad we've got a church that the altar is still you. Amen. I'm glad we've got a church where people still pray. And I'm afraid in a lot of places of worship today, that is missing. Amen. That is gone. Daniel was a high man of authority. Was he not? Was he not like second in the kingdom under Nebuchadnezzar? He served under numerous kings. He's been troubled over this vision about his people. And then I thought about what about us as Christians today? Have we lost our burden for our people that are lost? And on their way to hell. What if we were on our hands and knees. Helplessly. As dumb. You see I can't save nobody. And you can't save nobody. It shows total dependence upon a God that can. Let me move. Verse 16. I told you I wouldn't keep you long. Verse 16 says. And behold. One like the similitude. What does similitude mean? Similar, yeah, like. One like the similitude of the sons of men. Who could that be? Jesus referred to himself in the New Testament as the Son of Man. I'm not sure. Sons. Sons. But one, it says, one like, one like the similitude of the sons of men. I'm not sure it could be Christ. It could be another angel. I'm not sure. But it says, touched my lips, then I opened my mouth and spake and said unto him that stood before me, O my Lord, by the vision, my sorrows have turned upon me, and I have retained no strength. You've got to remember, if you go back to the beginning of chapter number 10, Daniel has been fasting for three full weeks. No wonder he's weak in body. I mean, you and I, we can't even fast for three hours now. We have trouble, man. And fasting's not just food. It's not just food. But we have trouble with it. 
I just wonder if it's not Christ. He says he touched my lips. He touched me. Oh, he touched me. And oh, the joy that floods my soul. You see, when you're as down and out and low as you can get, and I thought about this, when there's Daniel in that position, is dumb. In today's time, for a sinner to get saved, a lot of times they've got to hit rock bottom. Amen. They've got to get to the bottom of the barrel. They've got to get as low as they can get. Hey, you'll never get anybody saved until you can convince them they're lost. Yeah, right. I see this touch. You see, I see the hand of God coming through right here. No one can save themselves. I did not save myself, Jeff. You did not save yourself. Johnny, you didn't save yourself, and neither did anybody else in here. But I know the man that saved me. His Amen. name was Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Son of the living God. Amen. And if you've gotten saved, the same one touched you, and the same one saved you. So I see it as Christ the sacrifice. Verse 17. For how can the servant of this my Lord talk with this my Lord? For as for me, straightway, there remain no strength in me, neither is there breath left in me. To me, that shows man's lost condition. Man's lostness, man's weakness. I just said it. You'll never get anybody saved until you get them to see they're lost. Kevin, so many today are blinded by the gods of this world. Amen. And they think, I'm just as good as Penny. I'm doing just as good as she is. I can sit in the church just like Penny does. Huh? She comes to Sunday school. I come to Sunday school. She comes to Wednesday night prayer meeting and Bible study. I come to Wednesday night prayer meeting and Bible study. Does the devil not use things like that? Amen. Sure he does. He's a deceiver. That's what he's into. He's in the deception business. We have to realize You'll never get that saved until you see the weakness of man. All throughout the centuries, mankind has always tried to get to God and get to heaven. But the problem is they don't want to do it God's way. And God says there is one way, one truth, one life, and he is Jesus Christ. And there's only one way to get to God, and that's through the Son. We must realize that tonight. Amen. For how can the servant of my Lord talk with this my Lord? For as for me straightway there remain no strength in me, neither is there breath left in me. I also see right here that I don't care how strong you are as a Christian. Every one of us has a breaking point. Let's not ever get to the point that we think we're so holy, we're so righteous, we're so good that we cannot fail. Amen. May we as a church always be reminded when we see a brother or sister in Christ that fails not to stomp on them, but to try to be the ones to help lift them back up Amen. and encourage them. You see, you don't know what so and so's going through. And neither do I. There's some things as pastor, you the flock, you're not going to tell me. And you don't have to. Really. You don't. I see a lot of smiling faces week after week. But I also realize behind that smile, sometimes there's hurt. Can I say it's okay to be human? You're not a superhero with a cape on. You're not an angel. God knows exactly how we feel. The Bible says that we have a high priest, book of Hebrews, that can be touched. Because he is familiar with our infirmities. 
Amen. Amen. He became man to know how mankind feels and how mankind deals with things to be our helper. We get the Greek word from that means paraclete. Means to walk beside of. And he walks with me and he talks with me. How does he lead us beside still waters? The Bible says the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. How does he lead us beside still waters? Right with us. Right with us. Step at the time. You know what a shepherd does? He counts his sheep every day. At the end of the day, if any's been injured, if any's been hurt, if any needs salve, whatever the case may be, no wonder the psalmist says, he anointed my head with oil. He prepares me a table in the presence of mine enemies. How does, the, how does the good shepherd lead? By example. I tried to talk to Chris a little bit, and I know he's in the process. I think his church is talking to him. Chris, I'm sure, of his doctrine. He's, he's ready. He's a servant of God. God's called him to preach. There's not a doubt in my mind. But I've tried to do a little pastoring with him and help him to prepare him for what's ahead. You see, sheep and cattle are different. You drive cattle with a whip. But you lead sheep. You can't drive cattle. You don't drive sheep. You're with sheep. I'm glad that Jesus is with us every day. Every bad migraine headache you've ever had, he's right there. Every time you've had to go for surgery, He's right there. Every time you've looked at your bills and said, I don't know how I'm going to make this, God, he makes a way. Amen. 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 Every time. And what does that do? It increases our faith. It should increase our faith. How do we walk? By faith. And not by sight. How much dependence would you really depend upon God to meet your every need financially if you always had all? Hmm? And I'm also reminded here in this one verse, it says, well, how can the servant of this, my Lord, talk with this, my Lord? For as for me, straightway there remain no strength in me, neither is there breath left in me. See, there's times after you get so hopeless, and I, and I just remember this, I can only speak for me. Tying this all back together, we're going to go home here in a minute. Before I got saved, I had to realize I was lost. Just like I said earlier. What was I scared of? I don't know about you, but I was scared of going to hell. Amen. What did Jesus save me from? Amen. Hell. I've had people say, well, preacher, I don't know. You, you scare people sometimes when you preach about hell. Well, I hope it does. My intention is to scare the hell out of them. <laughs> Get to heaven. You know, I'm not going to paint hell as a pretty picture because it's not. It's a place of torment, weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. There's a fire that forever burns there. I remember an old-fashioned preacher stood up and he'd stomp and snort and slobber and spit and everything else. And I don't know what all he was saying, but I knew one thing. God was on him. And God was targeting me. And what I was a nine-year-old boy. I didn't know as much about the Bible as I know today, and I still don't know as much as I should. But I certainly didn't know enough at nine years old. Sister Don, I didn't. If they'd, said, if they'd got up there and said, I want you to quote 14 verses to prove that you can get saved, I couldn't have come up with 14. <laughs> well, I'm just being honest, ain't it? But you know what? I'm glad that ain't what he, he came to seek and to save those that were lost. I was lost, and that's why he came. And he came seeking, and thanks be unto God, he saved me. But you know what? 
I remember when I got up there and I knelt at that altar and my dad stepped down and was in a revival and he stepped down and he said, what can I do for you? I said, I want to be saved. He said, praise God. What do you want to be saved for? I don't want to go to hell. I remember that's what I said. I don't. Hey, the rest of it, you could have prayed anything you want to pray. Now, I don't know what I did the rest of the time. I got crying and I'm whip, weeping like a baby. Now, listen, you ain't got to cry and weep to get saved. I did. I was broken. Man, I was just, I needed a Savior. I'm glad those tears turned to tears of joy. Amen. But I don't remember what, but I do know this. It was real that night, and it's just as real today as it was that night. Because I said, Lord, save me. That is one prayer, Brother J.D., I know. If he's ever heard me pray one, he heard that one. And if he's ever answered one for me, he answered that one. I'll promise you that in the right way. See, that's the problem in churches today. We've complicated too many things. We're trying to make Christians live so holy and so righteous and there's no wrong in them. We're too dignified. We're too religious. We're too pharisaical. So what does that word mean? We're like Pharisees. We got it all together. On the outside, we let everybody know we got it all together. Preacher, that's good preaching. Somebody needed that today. <laughs> well, that somebody was probably you. <laughs> but we don't ever go that route. Because we good. We good. <laughs> we need to get back to realizing it's okay to be totally reliant and dependent Amen. upon God. Because I promise you, he is 150% able to meet our needs, no matter what it is. No wonder the Bible says we have not because we ask not. We think, God, I'm supposed to get this healing because I'm a good Christian. No, you'll get that healing because you ask for it. You have not. Because you ask not. I know we ain't getting out of this world alive. I realize that. I realize as we get older, and I thank God for every day he gives me. But I realize you don't have to be old to die. And all of us have an appointment to meet death. I realize that. But you know what? I'm afraid too many of us today, if we have a sickness, if we have an ailment, how many of us go to Dr. Jesus first before we go to the family doctor? There's nothing too small. There's nothing too big. We're his children. Do you like to hear from your children? If your children get bee stung, if they come and told you, Mama, Daddy, a bee stung me, you'd run and get the first aid kit and try to do something with it, even though they'll probably live from a bee sting. Most people. Some people's allergic to them. I know Guy, where you at, Guy? Guy carries one of them high-dollar pins around. If he gets stung, he's got to pop quick or he's out of here. But most people can survive a bee stung. But you know what? When your young ones got hurt, they fell down, skint their knee, come running to you. Mama, Daddy, oh, I'm hurt, and he's a crying. Didn't you have a heart of compassion? Huh? Well, sure you did. You didn't say, well, ah, oh, you tough, get on back out there. <laughs> no, you take them over, you clean that wound up, you wash it off, you put you some of that Watkins ointment salve on there. See, I ain't that young. <laughs> My grandma Wilson treated everything. Watkins salve. Or raw. You know what? That stuff works. <laughs> that stuff will work. If you don't believe me, I know I'm off subject a little bit right now. Next time you cut yourself pretty good, go get you a can of that. Put you some on that right there. T 
tell me if you're sore in the morning. <laughs> Next time you have surgery, get you some and put it on the incision. See how you're sore this evening. But what I'm saying is this. God's the same way with us. We're his children. When we skin ourselves, it's okay to run and cry and say, Abba, Daddy, help. He'll clean us up. We need to realize we're totally dependent upon him for everything we have in this life. Anybody got a question or comment there? Sure it is. We've got to have the childlike faith. The Bible teaches us that. What is childlike faith? Does a child know everything about the word of God? We've said faith is saying, God, we take you at your word. This is God's word. I don't understand it, but I believe it. That's faith. But what's a childlike faith? Daddy, I need help. Daddy, I need strength. Daddy, I'm blowing out. I'm discouraged. I'm ready to quit. I'm ready to stay home. Daddy, I can't do it. I'm at a breaking point, Daddy. He'll come to your rescue. He'll come to your rescue. Just make sure you don't have sin in your life. You know, some of us reach those breaking points as a result of sin in our life. Don't expect him to rescue you every time from sin you've committed. There is a price to pay for sin. I want to read a verse of scripture and we'll go. Even Jesus himself, after he was baptized, he was driven into the wilderness, the Bible says, or led up of the Spirit into the wilderness. For 40 days, he hungered and he thirsted. And then guess who showed up? Faith. Faith. Listen. The devil knows when to come get you. He knows when to put attack mode on you. That's why I try to tell people, stay in the word of God. Stay in the word of God. Bathe yourself in the word of God. Pray and talk to God. Daily. Try to live righteously. I know you're going to goof up every now and then. But don't stay goofed up. You know what I'm saying? If you goof up, get it right. Try to live like you should as a child of God. Because, see, the closer you are to God, the harder it is for the devil to get you. Hey. But the further you get away from God, you're easy picking for the devil. And you know what he picks? The easy prey. Even the devil, if you will, pardon my French, had the guts to try to go after the Son of God. But he didn't get him at his strongest. When did he show up? At his weakest. Thanks be unto God. Every three, all three times that the devil challenged him, Jesus says, but it is written. But it is written. Talking about the word of God. Too many times the devil will come to us and you start fighting him and you start fighting him out here. You can't fight him in his territory. He'll whoop you. You take him right here. You say, but it is written. It is written. But notice this in Matthew chapter 4 verse 11. Then the devil leaveth him. And behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Y'all still believe in angels? Amen. Do you believe they still come minister unto the children of God today? Amen. 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 Now listen, I'm going to shut up right here. And I hope you've got something out of this tonight. But as we started this study tonight, we found Daniel dumb on his face, helpless. 
But you show me one time in those verses we read where he was ever alone. You will not find it. And as a child of God tonight, I leave you with a promise from the word of God. You will never be alone either. Because he's promised. He'd never leave us. And he'd never forsake us. Even to the end of the world. Many of us at times in our life, we've left him. We've forsaken him. But never, ever, ever, you look back on your life, but never, ever, ever, did he leave you? Or did he forsake you? And the same with me. That's all I've got. We'll pick up about verse 18 next time we meet. Anybody got a question or comment pertaining to the Word of God? Brother Joe, I just want to ask everybody I start starting with. Let's pray for Scarlett. You know, it's rough when you're living in a house with a spouse that's pulling against you every way you turn. Mm -hmm. Just hard, you know. And uh, she, I thank God, she's sticking in here and trying to live right. And just she made that prayer. I know she talked with us about that the other Tuesday in the Bible study. Yeah, she desperately made that prayer. And, uh, and that husband, let's pray for him. You know, he get saved or whatever's wrong. Mm -hmm. you know, don't know his heart, but I mean, we know it's the truth. <laughs> Another old song we sing: "The harder the battle, the sweeter the victory." problem is we want the victory but no battle. Yeah. Anyone else? If not, we'll stand and be dismissed in a word of prayer. God bless you. Thank you for making your way out to God's house tonight. I trust you will be careful going home. I'll be looking for you Sunday morning in the Lord's house. If the rapture happens before then, I'll be looking for you in heaven. I hope you're there. I know I'm going to be. Don Osborne, would you dismiss us in prayer, please? Heavenly Father, once again, we just thank you for the opportunity you've given us tonight to gather here together. We thank you for each and every one that was able to come tonight. We also want to remember all those who could not come. We just ask that you send out your healing hand and touch them with us. We thank you also for Pastor Joe and this wonderful message he brought us tonight. This we do ask in Jesus' holy name. Amen. 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 God bless you all. Have a good night.